Please join me in giving Bob Love a warm Pachyderm Club welcome. Welcoming me to the club here is really a, an honor today. I, I bring greetings from uh, my family. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of you know a lot of them, uh, and they're, they're a pretty good group. Uh, my name is Robert Walter, and uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I didn't uh, originate either of those two names. I inherited both of them one from my grandfather, Walter, and one from my dad, Robert. And as I come today, I'm going to bring you a greeting from them, uh, as well as from myself, to sort of introduce the topic this morning, or this afternoon. Uh, the topic is central banking, and the topic is central planning. And we don't always think of those two uh, as going together. We don't necessarily think of them separately. But I've, I've come to the point where I'm convinced that they, they are uh, completely related to one another. You cannot separate them. And I want to explain to you this morning or this afternoon why I believe that. Can everyone hear me? Because I'm kind of working with this microphone. If you can't, let me know if it's too loud. Uh, let's start with uh, the little drawing that I, I presented to everybody. I want you to kind of look at that and just uh, think about it in your own mind as I as I talk because we're gonna we're gonna begin this morning or this afternoon with uh, let me see if I can get this here with a short lesson in economics and I kind of want to use Walter and Robert to illustrate my points. <clears throat> Walter was a farm boy. He grew up on the farm, and one thing that you learn on a farm about economics is a very simple lesson that your material well-being depends on three things your raw materials or your natural resources plus your labor times your tools it's a very simple equation and Walter learned it uh, early as most farm boys do not realizing that they've tapped into what I'll call God's primordial uh, equation for e economics. If you only know one thing about economics, this is the one thing that you need to know. Uh, however, Walter uh, was also raised and taught that labor, which is one of the elements of material well-being, is a right. Uh, actually, he was taught first that it's an obligation. and. Uh, as most farm boys uh, learn at an early age, if you don't work, your, your dad's all over you. And I think, <laughs> I think he got that message real early. But, but he did begin to appreciate that this obligation was a pretty special obligation, that it was a right, and he appreciated that, and that it's, it's a foundational right for all people. In fact, labor is the one thing that makes us all equal. We come into life with all sorts of inequalities, but one thing that we all possess is the ability to work. And so it was this right to labor that was really the fundamental basis of liberty in the United States and the fundamental basis of all liberty. Walter learned that lesson that uh, that labor is important, but he also learned that those who labor providently, and by that I mean who consume less than they produce, generate a surplus. And that surplus we call savings. And savings is a very special thing. Walter learned that it's very hard to generate savings. It takes hard work, and it takes prov providential lifestyle. The things that are very distant from us today, we just don't identify with those. Excuse me, I don't know if that's me. Uh, so the first three, the first three bullets in our in our point here today. Let's say that Walter learned those lessons, and he passed them on to his son Robert. What did Robert learn? Robert came back from uh, World War II 
at age 22, having seen a lot of things that uh, that young men probably shouldn't see, uh, and they changed his life. He wanted to go to work. He joined his dad uh, over at the factory on Commerce Street. It was a two-story building, just a few blocks from here. And Dad walked out in the plant and he looked around him and he saw that there was a lot of hard work taking place, a lot of labor. Uh, he also noticed one other thing in that building and that was there was a door between the front office and the plant. And his dad told him that that door was always to remain open. And the reason it was to remain open was because Walter understood that the well-being of his business and his family depended on the well-being of the people who were out in that plant. And that door was never to be closed. And Dad learned that lesson. But, as you'll see in a minute, it challenged him. Because Dad was not really into just working for the sake of working. He didn't grow up as a farm boy. He grew up playing golf with Bill Rounds and Jack Vickers and, and others. And he thought there's got to be an easier way. And he had been in the Army. He knew what mechanization was all about. So he waited. Oh, one thing I forgot to tell you about Walter. After he left the farm, he came to Wichita and he got a job as a bank teller. And there he learned that, what he already knew, that savings is important, that it's hard to get. And he learned that money is for lending, not for borrowing. And uh, so kind of keep that in mind. That was Walter's uh, bias toward uh, the function of money. Well, my dad came back and uh, and he, he made his way into Love Box Company and uh, when he realized that, uh, that his father believed that money was for lending, he realized that this was going to present him with some problems because he wanted to get some machinery. And there wasn't enough saved in the company after the World War to do what he wanted to do. So he waited for his dad to go on vacation. <laughs> And as soon as his dad went on vacation, he went to the bank and he borrowed money. Now, he was borrowing someone else's savings now. It wasn't his, his own savings that he was going to spend. It was somebody else's. And he knew his dad wouldn't be comfortable with that. Uh, but he didn't have to face his dad yet because his dad was on vacation with, with uh, Betty Love, who was a very opinionated lady in her own right. And Dad took the money and he spent it. He bought a forklift, three wheels, gas-fired, spewed out carbon monoxide so thick that you could hardly breathe in the plant. But everybody loved it. It was incredible the amount of work that that tool could perform. Uh, and after, after about uh, two or three weeks, Dad was sure this was the right thing, but after four weeks, Grandpa came back from vacation. <laughs> and Dad used to tell the story, he'd say, I, I was in the office, sitting at my desk, when, uh, and I knew that he was going to be coming in, and that forklift out in the plant was so noisy, running back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. It was going to be awfully hard to hide. <laughs> and he said, I wanted to shut that door in the worst way between the plant and the office, but I didn't dare do it. And sure enough, Walter came in and he greeted people in the office and Dad watched and he saw that forklift go shooting by the door and the loud noise. And he, his father looked over and he said, what was that? And it shot back the other direction and he looked, looked over and said, what's going on out there? And Dad said he walked over to the door and he looked out and he, for about 10 minutes he just watched this forklift going back and forth and back and forth. And Dad said I, that he'd hunkered down at his desk and he was ready to take whatever beating his father was going to dole out to him. <coughs> And he said his, his dad turned around, grandpa turned around, 
walked to his office, sat down, and never said anything to him about it. <laughs> what, Walt, what Robert learned, which Walter didn't fully understand because he was very conservative, but what, Walt, what Robert learned was that tools and labor, labor and tools, multiply one another and that they're always in competition with each other. And that's very important to remember. They're always in competition with, you, with each other. And that the businessman, the capitalist, the entrepreneur, whatever you're going to call him, is constantly making a decision about, should I use tools or should I use labor? And he's weighing the costs of each. The cost of labor is influenced by wages. The cost of tools is influenced by the interest rate. Because you have to go borrow that money, right? And you have to earn that rate of return. And if that interest rate's not, not low, you're going to tend to go for the, the guy with a strong back and a, and a good heart. If the interest rate's really low, uh, you're going to tend to have a bias toward more tools. So Robert and Walter brought this knowledge to Love Box Company and, and taught me that free individuals make individualized, decentralized economic plans which they execute in voluntary associations through exchanges. Okay? There's a basic lesson in what I inherited as a knowledge of economics. But I have something to add to it. Because when I arrived from the University of Chicago with a law degree and an MBA in the, in the mid-1970s, Richard Nixon had just closed the gold window. And what happened when he closed the gold window was he detached money from the commodities that it should be attached to, to keep it honest. And he unleashed fiat credit. And fiat credit was my generation. Uh, after Nixon, it didn't take long for Greenspan to show up and we know what began to happen. And I wasn't fully aware of this, even though I had a law degree and an MBA, I really didn't realize what was happening, but I did, notice, I did notice some very important things were happening at Lovebox. One is our customers were getting bigger, faster, okay? Two is everyone was borrowing a lot of money, and there seemed to be a lot of money to borrow. Uh, as the borrowing took place and the companies grew in size, they began to centralize. Customers who had been local, who we had been able to service for years, were now part of bigger groups that took them over. Purchasing moved out of Wichita, moved to somewhere else. We were challenged now with the fact that we couldn't just be a good box company in the Midwest. We had to have national presence, regional presence. Centralization was taking place. Uh, automation, outsourcing, all of these things required could not have happened in my grandfather's lifetime. There wasn't enough credit available for all of those things to happen at the same time. But in my generation, it happened. And, and we're now on the other side of that. And so, Keep that in mind. That's our basic fundamental lesson in economics before we go further. Now I want to pause just right quick and ask any questions about this basic lesson in economics. Good, no questions, okay. Let's go on to the next uh, step here, which is a basic and fundamental lesson in uh, politics. And I'm going to go real fast now because I know a lot of you guys are busy and, and ladies and have to get away. Uh, and please don't hesitate to, if you have to go, to go. But, and all of this that I'm saying, by the way, is, is it's on a website where you can go and you can absorb it because it's going to take you some time. It's not something that you can just glance over. But politics, individual freedom was in it was talked about all the time. It was the foundation stone of everything that we believed in, and I think it's the foundation of American, uh, of the American way of life. Uh, it has to do with the absence of coercion. It has to do with, with being able to pursue 
your own individualized, decentralized economic plan without anyone interfering with you. Uh, it doesn't seem like much, but it's, it can be a, it's a, it's a really a fundamental principle. And I think one of the more important things that we need to realize is it's the only political end that is fully consistent with a man's individual right to labor. There is no other political system that is consistent with the individual right to labor than one based on individual freedom. It's just the way it is. It's, it's the logic of the thing. Uh, however, we do have to act collectively, and in collective action, uh, the Founding Fathers learned early on that democracy is a way that we can act collectively. Uh, however, uh, what they also learned was that there are strict rules for, excuse me, I'm not used to this, there are strict rules for how democracy uh, works, okay? And I think the thing that we need to remember is democracy's purpose is to preserve individual liberty. It's not, it's not some, uh, some uh, religion that, that, that uh, aggrandizes majority rule. The purpose of democracy has to be fundamentally based on individual liberty. And democracy can do that but it can only do it as long as democracy follows what I'll call the three D's. And these are set out, in fact, they're all from Thomas Jefferson. Deposit, all rights have to be deposited in the individual, rule number one. Delegate, rule number two. You only delegate when the individual is incapable of performing a function on his own or a lower level of government is incapable of performing a function, you delegate to a higher level. Thomas Jefferson goes over this beautifully in a letter in 1812. It's in the documents that are, related, that are set forth in the website. The third D is dissolve. Once a delegation becomes uh, uh, unnecessary for any reason, you dissolve it. That keeps democracy functioning in a way that's consistent with individual freedom. However, we are human beings and sloth and narcissism are part of our makeup. And what we begin to do politically is we begin to say that, hey, what's, what Walter and Robert found hard, we can avoid if we all get together and we have a central plan to take advantage of economies or whatever promises are made that we that we can by all coming together we can we can reduce the total expenditure of natural resources and labor to produce a given unit of material well-being and it's boy it is a tantalizing promise uh, it's the essence of socialism, and it always has to do with social well-being. We can increase our social well-being, our material well-being, if we come together. And it sounds great. Of course, it immediately violates the three Ds of democracy, but it's okay because by that time we put those three Ds behind us and we're just looking and focusing on democracy as majority rule. and. If, if we have to put, mix a little socialism in with it and do some planning, well, let's go for it if it's going to bring benefits. Basic lesson in politics and how politics degenerates, how democracy begins to descend to majority rule and how that's where the trouble starts. Let's go quickly. Money and credit. I'm only going to notice a note, uh, note a couple of things. When we talk about money, Basically, we should be talking about commodities, okay? The first three types of money here, commodity money, credit money, and banknotes, all have to do with commodities. The second two types, which is fiat credit and counterfeit money, are detached from commodities. And that's a real important distinction to make in your understanding of money and credit. Once you detach commodities from money and credit, 
you have something happening and, and capable of happening which can't happen as long as they're attached, right? I'm gonna skip quickly over uh, this to uh, money and credit, we're gonna go to banking. I know this is a lot to take in and I really do encourage you to go to the website and kind of look through this. There's private banking and there's public banking and basically I'm gonna say private banking, the key is, is a voluntary, an association of people where those savings can find investment. Central banking or public banking is any banking action that relies for its completion on coercion by state, by, by, by some state action, right? And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna identify central banking as, as that for the moment. All right. So we've had a basic lesson in politics, we've had a basic in economics and politics, and in money and banking. Now we're gonna go to central planning. And what is central planning? Basically central planning is a way to begin to, to, to replace all the interactions that are taking place in this complicated sheet. And, and uh, decentralized economics is complex. Uh, what central planning does is, is basically says there's a better way than decentralized decision making. Uh, I have a quote uh, from uh, Harry Truman who said, if you can't convince them, confuse them. And, and that's what we get a lot in politics, uh, especially when it comes to central planning. People don't understand it. Uh, it's very confused. Uh, but in order not to try and define it, I want to give us a couple of some hallmarks of how we can observe central planning is happening around us. And these are pretty much taken from a book by F.A. Hyatt called Road to Serfdom, which you may have heard of and you may have read. But the first one is the seduction of freedom. Uh, there's a quote by Chesterton there, but basically the way that we are seduced is our lust for material well-being. Remember that farm boy, he knew his material well-being depended on natural resources, labor, and tools. But if you go to someone and say, I can provide you material well-being and you don't have to work for it, your labor isn't going to be required. Uh, it sounds awfully good, doesn't it? But it is basic seduction. And that's how central planning always starts. That's how democracy fails. That's how central planning starts, is the seduction of liberty. Uh, let me turn to something here because there's a couple of things I want to read you. <clears throat> when the, when the, about seduction of liberty, when, uh, when the Federal Reserve Act was passed in 1913, Woodrow Wilson gave an address to the Senate uh, and here's what he said. Tell me if this sounds seductive to you. It is not enough to strike the shackles from business by abolishing tariffs. The duty of statesmanship is not negative merely. We must show that we understand what business needs and that we know how to supply it. No man can fail to see that one of the chief things business needs now is the proper means by which readily to, re to vitalize its credit. Now listen to this statement. What will it profit us to be free if we don't have the best and most accessible instrumentalities of commerce and enterprise? What will it profit us to be free if we don't have material well-being? Is that seductive? That's the, fundamental, that's the fundamental basis of all socialism right there. Why, why do we want to hold on to our freedom if it doesn't provide us with material well-being? Okay? And people buy that and as soon as they buy that, they start the descent, the road to serve them be, is, is initiated. 
Uh, the second hallmark of central planning is the castration of competition. And this is incredibly important, and I, I don't have time to go through all of it, but I'm going to hit the high points. You've got to go to the website, you've got to read through this because it's really valuable and, it, and it's critical. But here's a quote by Franklin Roosevelt, okay? Competition has been shown to be useful up to a certain point, but no further. But cooperation, that's, that's one of the catchwords of the socialist, but cooperation, which is the thing we must strive for today, begins where competition leaves off. Hayek makes such a persuasive case that one of the greatest hallmarks of, of central planning is the elimination of competition. But it's not just any competition here. It's, it's, there's several specific things that are happening with central banking. Think of all that credit that is circulating out there, all right? Uh, now, look back at your drawing just right quick and tell me, as you look at uh, capital, the red, the red box in the middle, uh, where is the funding coming uh, for investment? What does it arise from? What did Walter Love learn? That what always precedes investment? What has to precede investment? Savings. What? Savings. Savings, right. Savings has to precede investment. And if you look at your drawing, those savings are flowing up from the middle laboring class, right? From the people who work. Remember how Walter had to, he had to spend less than he earned, correct? to generate savings so that there was money to invest. Uh, once, he, once he did that, uh, he had something valuable. And that was his savings. And you know what? Anyone who wanted to borrow money had to compete for Walter's savings. Whether it was the government, whether it was the business next door, they all had to compete with each other for his savings. Now, uh, that's really a foreign concept for us today because we just don't think of savings as being that valuable anymore. We think, why should savings be a critical, important part of an economy? Well, there's plenty of money. You can always go to the bank and borrow money. In fact, in today's world, the consumers borrow money at the same time the corporations borrow money at the same time the government borrows money. Everyone's borrowing money. Well, what is the function of savings anymore? But think about it. Look at the drawing, okay? When, uh, when the government and the businesses no longer have to compete for savings because of this fiat credit. And over to the right-hand side of the drawing, you see fiat credit entering in to, the, to, our, to our economy here. And this fiat credit begins to replace the, the savings function that was a critical vital part of the middle class and the laboring class. Competition for savings is removed by the Federal Reserve. The businesses no longer have to compete for, that, for Walter's savings. In fact, the banks don't have to compete either. We're getting to the point where they don't even want his savings because it's, it's a liability. Think about that. What has happened economically? Walter and every saver had huge economic and political power based on the fact that they could save. And once the Federal Reserve came in and began to supply savings directly to government and to business, bypassing the middle class, bypassing labor, guess what happened? Government and corporatism got a life of their own. The middle class lost its economic power, lost its political influence, 
and a huge separation began to develop in an economy that before had been interconnected and interdependent. Is this making sense to people? It happens because competition is eliminated by central banking. And that's a big, it's a big deal right here, but it's not the only thing. There's other kinds of competition. The financial enslavement of labor. Look back at your drawing again and think about this. Uh, what happens when labor and tools compete? Okay? They replace one another, correct? Uh, labor must always compete with tools. Uh, and I'm going to read a statement to you here. In a decentralized economy based on private credit, supplied by labor, the progress prevalence and power of tools to compete is limited by labor's ability to earn a surplus which can fund capital investment and by the tools ability to earn a profitable return on that investment. If you look at your drawing, see the little box that says interest rates and the little box that says wage rates. Interest rates and wage rates are variables that keep an economy in equilibrium. Uh, but what happens if you push the interest rate down consistently? Well, what do they tell us is supposed to happen? Just quickly from somebody. What, what do they tell you is supposed to happen? Why does the Federal Reserve, why does the central bank suppress the interest rate? Yes, and if we see that in our drawing, right, because interest rates also go over to finished goods. So we have our guy who's this laborer who works out in the factory at La Box Company, and he says, hey, they're going to lower my payment to 2% on that new truck I want. Wow! I like that. He rushes out and he buys the truck, right? What he doesn't realize is that the 2% interest rate also permits the guys in the front office at Love Box Company to look at that flexo that they've been lusting for for the last decade but haven't been able to afford. But now it's affordable. So what do we do? Borrow money, buy the tool, right? So the interest rate went down and it seemed really great for that guy who wanted the truck and it seemed great for Love Box Company who wanted that new tool, but about 12 months later after that machine gets installed, guess what? We don't need the guy with the truck. The tools just replaced him. Right? This is, this is anti competition. That guy can no longer compete because the tools have been subsidized. So the second hallmark of central planning is the loss of competition. And these are two very big suppressions of competition. All right? Uh, but there, is, there are other hallmarks. And I'm just going to mention the third. Concentration of wealth and disparity of income. This one was fascinating to me. Uh, it's certainly something that we observe today in the world around us. And when we think about it, as the middle class gets cut out of the economy, it begins to drop, okay? And so we have this big gap forming and we have this huge disparity and everyone wonders, why is this happening? What, what's changed? Uh, well, now we're starting to get a little bit of an idea in our minds, oh, I see what's changed. Uh, we've detached the middle class completely from the economy. Their savings are no longer integral to the functioning of the economy. Uh, I'm not going to say a lot more about disparity of income. Uh, it is fascinating. And, and I'll simply say this, that for those who have huge amounts of wealth and resources, they also have, in a decentralized economy, they have huge competition. And they have what I call wealth weakness because nobody can be good at everything all the time. 
And so they find people showing up everywhere who have a better way to manage resources in a certain area and they can't keep up. So in a decentralized economy, wealth tends to distribute itself because of wealth weakness. It's hard for people to get a lot of it, like, like the dragon in Tolkien's uh, story. Dragons don't happen in decentralized markets. But once you add central planning, guess what? You begin to remove competition for those wealth resources. And as you remove it, the wealth resources get concentrated, and as they get concentrated, they further concentrate. It builds on itself. So it's, that's another area where competition is being destroyed, okay? Uh, let's go on quickly because, as usual, I'm falling behind. There's too many good things to say. So we've looked at the hallmarks of central planning. Uh, the last thing I want to look at are, is really the seven steps from, from freedom to tyranny. These are seven steps that you will always observe as central planning unfolds. One is, and I'll let, you can read through them here. The majority says we need to agree on something. It, we need to agree on something. We can do this better. That's the socialist line that starts it all downhill. Two, they, they try to agree on something and they realize they can't because it's too complex. These economies are not easy to manage, okay? So three, they say, we can't agree on anything, so we'll elect our representatives and we'll let them agree to reduce some plan to certain rules of conduct and that will become our plan. And this is, it's as critical to understand the rules of conduct. This is, this level, when central planning reaches this level, there's still hope because we have what, what I'll call the rule of law. That's what Hayek calls it. The problem is the rule of law in a complex economy tends to be Procrustean. Who knows who Procrustes was? Look him up, okay? He, had a, he, was a, he was a government guy, and he had a bed in Greece, and if you were on his hit list, and you were too short, he stretched you to fit the bed. And if you were too tall, like some of the big guys in this room, he just cut your feet off, and one size fits all. That's central planning. Procrustes was a central planner. But there's a lot of dissatisfaction with central plans. And as the dissatisfaction grows, the rules of conduct, which are right here, get discarded. And guess what they get replaced by? Now we're just going to give power to someone so they can pursue the desirable results. Well, don't confuse us anymore with rules. We don't want rules. We want results. That's more important. Arbitrary power begins to creep in in the pursuit of results. But even as that happened, the as that happens, the arbitrary, the, uh, now autonomous planners find they can't even meet all the desired results. So they begin to redefine, disregard, and substitute results as they need to. And when that doesn't work, and they get to a single result, and they can't even accomplish that, which, does that sound like the Federal Reserve today? We're just going to focus on one thing, employment. And that's all we're going to focus on. When that proves elusive, the planners resort to a mentality that says, let's do whatever it takes. That's, and that's, that's the last step before <laughs> dictatorship in central planning. Seven steps for central planning. And go through and read them. They're happening in central, and they've happened in central banking. Uh, and here's how they happen America's six steps. We've gone through six. I'm not going to go through these historically with you because I, I wish I could, but uh, we just don't have time. But basically, we have reached the we have reached step six. Here, step three, when the Federal Reserve was created, we did have a rule. And 
and the rule is incredible, and it's still on the books. I mean, that's the most amazing thing to me. Once I discovered that that rule was still on the books, I asked myself, why aren't they following that rule? Uh, and, I re and, and I was very frustrated by it, and I filed a lawsuit on my own, Federal District Court, right down the street here, uh, in 2015, because I said, you can't just disobey that, you can't just violate that rule. We're still a nation of laws. Uh, I had a, had a rude awakening, but, but it helped me because I realized that in our central planning, we have moved past step three, and that we have moved all the way down to step six. Richard Nixon helped us here. Uh, the Humphrey Hawkins bill helped us here. Alan Greenspan helped us here. And now we've reached helicopter money, and uh, we are well into the end game. Okay? Uh, step seven is the last step, and uh, that's where we stand today. America stands on the edge of the seventh step with respect to central banking. It's a very dangerous position that we're in. You just, you won't fully appreciate it. You'll go away from this meeting and you'll say, I just can't, I just can't get it. But I've been sort of working through this through three generations and I, it's possessing me. I can't get away from it. Uh, and here's, here's basically why. If you want to oppose socialism in America today, there's two ways to approach it and central planning. One is what I call the Hercules strategy, clean it up. Hercules got assigned his fifth task was to go into this stable that was tremendously neglected and clean out all the horse crap that had accumulated forever and ever and ever. And that's what a lot of people think the best strategy is to dealing with the problems we have in America, clean it up. But there is another strategy that I call the Samson strategy, and that's bring it down. And think about this. Samson was a slave. He was surrounded by all sorts of manifestations of evil, wickedness, and corruption. He could have set out as a reformer to deal with each one, but he didn't. What did he do? He said, all I have to find is one pillar that holds this whole thing up. And if I can move that one pillar, the rest comes down on its own. All right? That's where I am in my life. Because there is only one pillar holding up this entire system of endless wars and perversion in, in every possible way that we can imagine, and that's central banking. Without central banking, or with central banking being forced to return to some sort of a rule, it would all come down. And it would come down fast. And it would begin to return massive amounts of power to the people. Uh, so, I have a, a plan, and it's not right here, but you'll find it on my website. Uh, I want to make a public demand on the Federal Reserve. And I'm looking for 56 signers, and I'm looking for as many people to join as I can. And you can go to my website, you can, you can read it all there. I can't share it all with you. <clears throat> but it's to carry out the Sampson plan, because I don't want to fight the county commissioner. I don't want to fight Topeka. I don't want to fight the mayor. I don't even want to fight the Congress. I just want to get rid of the one thing that they all have in common that permits them to become corrupted. And that's fiat money. I'm going to end it there. Take questions. You've been very patient. Thank you very much for your time. And I, I, did put, I, did put, I did put the link here on, on your drawing. Take it with you. The link there is to my uh, blog site that I put together. The blog site is titled Froth, F-R-O-T-H, because that's what I think the Federal Reserve is, is froth. Uh, and it's an aggregate, froth, froth is defined as an, that's working now. froth is defined, 
No. no. I don't think so. Sorry, I thought maybe it had started to work. Froth is defined as an aggregation of bubbles, okay? And that's why I called it froth. But F-R-O-T-H stands for something. Listen to this. Federal Reserve on trial here. Froth, okay? Go to the blog site, get educated, join my petition, and let's raise hell. Thank you. First of all, thank you for an outstanding economics lesson. That, that is really good that you did present. I appreciate it. It's simple. Well, you, you, you go, well, I, go ahead if you want to. Too many people today, too many people, including people in this room, feel incapable of talking about the Federal Reserve or central planning because they think economics is... They feel like economics is too removed from, from their ability to function, and that's simply not true. Every farm boy understands what economics is, and every businessman certainly does, and every guy driving a pickup truck should. Well, I'm a North Dakota farm boy, and I've never understood why, if inflation is such a bad thing, why is deflation also considered bad? I understand stability being a, a, a nice thing, but if we can, inflation is so bad, why is deflation considered also bad? Inflation and deflation happen around us every day, okay? Uh, when we define them in terms simply of money, it becomes a little confusing for us, but the price of bread, vis-a-vis -vis the price of oranges or the price of a car, those are constantly changing. It's just when we relate our commodities to a, a commodity like gold or silver or money that we have this concept of changing prices. But prices are always fluctuating. They're always changing. In fact, as we saw in our drawing, the price level is critical. It has to go up and down to keep demand and supply in, in relationship with each other. I think the key thing that you're touching on is that we experience inconvenience or we experience uh, uh, trouble economically and the first thing that we do is decide there's got to be a better way. I shouldn't be feeling any pain in terms of a recession. And so we say, we listen for that first politician who says, I can show you an easier way. You don't have to go through this. And that's the seduction of freedom, right? We're going to have troubles. It's going to be difficult. There are going to be ups and downs. Don't cast your principles aside at the first sign of trouble and difficulty. And unfortunately, that's what we do. And I think the reason that we do it is we are not sufficiently convinced of the fundamental rules of what I'll call God's primordial plan for man's material well-being. If you tie in to that simple equation for man's material well-being, and the next time a politician promises you he can provide you material well-being outside of that, tell him, I don't believe you. Next. Other questions? Back here, Bob. Yeah. Bob, thanks also for being here and for doing the research and putting the pieces together. That was outstanding. My question is, um, do you, just to be explicit, do you uh, argue for a full dissolution of the Fed and a restoration of competitive uh, private banking, uh, which has in the past tended to a commodity-based money rather than the fiat currency we currently have? I, I love commodity-based money. I think it's, in the long run, is the only way to go. But we have a short run crisis right now in America. And that is, we are on step number six. And step seven is just ahead of us. And unfortunately, step, step, step seven is going to be catastrophic. Uh, and it's going to entail literally financial tyranny. Okay? So we have a choice right now to step back from the brink. The question that you're asking really, if you think of it this way, uh, is this. You're asking, and excuse me for that, 
but uh, let's see if I can get back here. Uh, you're, you're really asking if we can go back past step one, because step one here is where the majority decides that decentralized economic activity is not the best way to go. And if you go back, this is where, this is where central planning starts in step one. Commodity money and a decentralized economy is all prior to that, all right? So think of it this way. We have reached this point. We have reached step six. What I'm proposing right now is to go back initially to step three, a rules-based Federal Reserve. The beautiful thing about it is no one has to pass any new laws. Nobody has to do anything. We simply have to acknowledge that we have permitted the Federal Reserve to jettison the rules that are in place on the books today. This was the whole subject of my lawsuit. And if you, if you go through that, you'll, you'll begin to get a grip on the fact that there are rules in place. The rules are very simple. They basically say the Fed has to maintain aggregate money and credit that grow and contract at the same rate as real production. Now think about that. <coughs> what is real production? Commodity, right? This is on the books. It's there. If the Fed has to, con has to manage aggregate credit in line with real production, we have taken a huge step back toward controlling money so that it stays in relationship with the commodities that we're producing. And we could do that tomorrow if the spineless bureaucrats in Washington, including Mike Pompeo and including both our senators, would simply stand up and say, there are laws on the books and the Fed is basically in total violation of them with our approval, with our, with our, uh, they're co-conspirators in this whole thing. And think about it, why are they? They can't do what they're doing without all that credit. That's why I said the, the Samson strategy is bring it all down and there's only one pillar we have to move. You don't have to go clean out the stables. You just have to do one thing, remove that pillar, and everything will start to change overnight. I hope I answered we, your question. Yes, we're going to have time for one more question. We're actually over time, so we'll make this one really quick. I really apologize. That's okay. Since negative interest rates are showing up around the world for central banks, aren't we at stage seven? Uh, no, I don't think we are at stage seven. I, I, think we are, I think we're on the very verge of it, Carl. But stage seven is, read this, it's the final step when the majority in the democracy overtly awards complete and arbitrary power to the dictator or the oligarch. If, if one thing is clear from this last election is that there's still a hell of a lot of people out there who are not ready to do that. Does that make sense? <coughs> the Federal Reserve is the oligarch. And, and they, are pushing, they are pushing with all their power. They have already reached step six on their own. We've permitted them to go this far. They already are saying whatever it takes. If that means negative interest rates, that means negative interest rates. They're here, you're right. But step seven is up to us. Step seven is up to us. And I, I believe with all my heart that there's still enough people who, if they could get this message and understood it, I, I don't know if it can penetrate the establishment. I really don't. I, I, I wish I could give you more hope, but I don't think we're there. In fact, it may be turning around. Let's hope. Go, go sign my petition, would you? And let's, let's get this thing moving. Uh, thank you for your patience. It's really been great.